Welcome to MacroHive Conversations with Bilal Hafiz. We aim to bring you the best macro analysis to help you successfully invest in financial markets. For our latest analysis, visit macrohive.com. COVID is once again sweeping across Europe and markets are reacting. The picture is fast changing. And so we published a piece looking at which countries we think are most vulnerable in the coming few weeks. Crypto markets continue to be a focus for investors with Bitcoin looking to stabilize after a very large correction. To better understand whether the correction is over, we looked at the biggest corrections in the past to see whether there are any parallels with today. And we can't have a week without talking about inflation, but rather than joining the masses and talking about October data, we look at the past 1,000 years of inflation. Yes, 1,000 years. You can read all of this and more as a member of MacroHive at MacroHive.com. And as a member, you get access to all of our research reports, our archive, our webinars, our transcripts of podcasts, and crucially, our member Slack room, where the MacroHive team and members discuss markets all hours of the day. It's refreshingly different from Twitter. Membership to MacroHive normally costs the same as a few weekly cappuccinos, but we're borrowing a tradition from our cousins over the pond in the US by offering a special rate during this Thanksgiving, Black Friday, Cyber Monday, whatever the marketers are calling it these days, holiday period. The special rate is that you can get two months membership for just $1 or one pound or 0.000029 bitcoins. Yes, we do take Bitcoin payments. So now there's no excuse not to join MacroHive. Just go to macrohive.com. Now on to this episode's guest, Nancy Davis. Nancy is the founder and managing partner of Quadratic Capital Management. She is the portfolio manager of the Quadratic Interest Rate Volatility and Inflation Hedge ETF called iVol. She founded Quadratic in 2013. She began her career at Goldman Sachs, where she spent nearly 10 years predominantly in prop trading, where she later became head of credit derivatives and OTC trading. Prior to starting at Quadratic, she served as a PM at Highbridge Capital Management. Now, on to our conversation. So greetings, Nancy. It's great to have you on the podcast. I've been looking forward to our conversation. Thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to it as well. Well, the first thing I always like to do when I have any guests on the podcast is to learn a bit about their background. So it'll be great to know where you went to university, what you studied, and was it inevitable you'd go into finance and then something about the journey you've had until where you are now? Well, definitely, I didn't know even what finance was when I entered university. So it was not at all you know, something I wanted to do from high school days. I was very fortunate to have a scholarship to attend college, an academic scholarship. And then I had a job as well to help support myself during college. And it was really through my job that I got involved in the whole finance industry and learning about the derivative markets. And so I was very fortunate to have a great opportunity there. Great. And then after college and university, what was your first job you had? Was it in finance, the first job? Yes. My first non, when I was not a student job, like full-time employee was at Goldman Sachs. So yeah, I, I worked at the firm for about a decade. Okay, great. And which desks were you on and, and why did you end up in those desks? So for the majority of my career, I was on the proprietary desk. So we were managing Goldman's own capital. It was a, a great environment to be. We didn't have clients. We weren't market makers. We were just trying to make money for the firm. And it gave us a lot of flexibility, especially across asset classes to look for whether it was in credit markets or commodities or equities or converts or rates. We really had a lot of flexibility. And then after Goldman's, you struck out on your own to launch your own strategy or, and your own fund. I had a couple steps in between before I launched my own fund. But I was recruited out of, of Goldman to a hedge fund, like a buy side, buy side firm. It was JP Morgan's hedge fund. And that was actually pretty good timing to leave. Just, you know, lucky timing. It wasn't, it wasn't like I had some crystal ball, but I ended up accepting the job in October 2007. And then I resigned from Goldman January 6, 2008. So it was a good time to be stepping out of a Wall Street firm and going to a hedge fund. It's, it's quite funny. Whenever people have moves in the year 2000, 2008, 2009, they always mention the months that they moved, just so it's clear whether it was before Lehman's, after Lehman's, and around that sort of time. That period is seared into everyone's minds and souls and, and everything. 
Yeah, it, well, it was my first job out of college. And I think it was also very traumatic when I did resign. So I remember the date. I don't think it has much to do with 08 as much as I just felt terrible quitting and, and was very nervous about it. Yeah, I felt the same when I left JP Morgan. So I started off at JP Morgan in the late 90s and then moved to Deutsche Bank. And it is very hard to do the first sort of switch. And it's also hard when you go to a rival sales side firm as well. You know, there's some extra sort of psychological pressure that they introduce when you do those sorts of things. So then that was, that was high Highbridge, uh, JP. And then after that, after Highbridge? After Highbridge, I actually took the reason that I ended up leaving Goldman was I had just had a second child and I was commuting very, very long hours from Connecticut to lower Manhattan. My commute was about at best three hours a day, but often three and a half to four, depending on if you miss a train, you have to wait for the next one. So in the morning, it was always very stable because I would get on the train, go coming back, sometimes the subway would be delays, you'd you know, miss the train at Grand Central by like two minutes, and then you're stuck waiting for the next one. So it goes from an hour and a half to closer to two. But yeah, that was the only reason I did leave was just to the hybrid opened a Greenwich office for me, which is why I left. And I also had a flexible work arrangement. Okay, great. Yeah. And then after hybrid, after Highbridge, I was a stay-at-home mom and I came back to my career when my youngest started kindergarten. And I decided I didn't want it to be too much of a shock to my kids. So I decided I would go more by side by side rather than back to the hedge fund world. But I found out that I love markets. I'm obsessed with it. I remember my boss telling me, he's like, you know, I was watching like the Bank of Japan come out on Sunday night and sending email updates. And he's like, you know, we can never pay you for the amount of work you're doing. I was like, don't worry, I love it. <laughs> it's, uh, I love markets. But it was a really great confidence booster to kind of come back and be like, I, I still understand this stuff. Nothing's changed. It's just a different point of time. All the skills that I had before are still here. And it really kind of gave me the confidence to say, I think I'm exceptional at what I do. I think I'm very, you know, uniquely skilled at, at what I, what I do for a living and give me, it gave me the courage to really go out and say, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to do this on my own. I'm going to go literally hang a shingle, start a firm. And you know, it takes, I think a lot of guts to go from, being in a job where you're paid to work to going to become an entrepreneur where you're literally paying other people to work for you and you're getting paid nothing. <laughs> so it's actually negative income until you get to that, you know, break even amount. But I absolutely love doing it. I've been running my own business now for over eight years and and I love it. And I also feel very passionate about trying to pull other people into the entrepreneurial aspect because I think if you if you do something that betters client outcomes, it's a great thing to start a business around it and not just make it a job, make it really a firm and a company and a culture. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And you've obviously been very successful over that period of time. And we'll talk a bit more about some of the details of the funds or the ETFs that you're behind as well. And just, just a question on the career break. I mean, you did say that when you came back into markets, you kind of slotted in very, very well. So that's always the kind of the question I've always I wondered, if you take time out from markets, what does feel like you're going to lose all those skills, but obviously not in, in your case? Yeah, I do think there's always that fear that if people take time off that you won't be able to come back into the same role or you won't be able to be a senior or your skill sets were road. Or I think I was fortunate as a portfolio manager that I wasn't, you know, if I was in sales, for instance, and I had been out of the market and my relationships were what drove my business, that might be a different environment. But I think being a portfolio manager, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't like I was depending on relationships where I can see it vary depending on what you do in specifically in the finance industry. If you can take time out and come back, you know, portfolio, close it down, you open it up. <laughs> it's different day, different year. It doesn't really matter. So I think I was lucky because I've never been in sales or marketing or client stuff before. So I think it would be different if you were, you were on the sell side, sell side. Yeah, no, that's that's true. And in terms of the strategies that you run and the way you've done it, one way would have been to launch a hedge fund and then you do the usual run around to get funds into the hedge fund. But you've you've gone down a different route. So can you can you sort of talk about why you did that, the launching an ETF, that approach and whether it constrains you or not, or whether it's more flexible? Yeah, I didn't really know much about ETFs initially. I thought of them as more 
you know, passive index replicated uh, retail products. But when I learned actually more about the ETFs, I was like, wow, this makes a lot of sense for what I do. And it would better client outcomes because it would give the transparency of a managed account. It would give lower fees and more liquidity, which I think is one thing all portfolios need, especially with so many institutional portfolios moving to illiquids that there is no, you know, kind of that liquidity profile is super important. Not when everything's going up, but at some point you're going to want it. And I just had the epiphany, I think, of having public securities that are liquid inside of a private fund wrapper doesn't make a lot of sense for clients. I think it makes the reason that it's so common is it's better for managers, right? Because they can lock up the capital, they can charge higher fees, but matching the underlying investments to the fund wrapper, I thought was a very simplistic, easy way. I invest in public securities, put it in a public fund. Okay. Yeah. So then it's the wrapper you use as an ETF. And I mean, how much discretion can you have with an ETF wrapper? Because my impression like yours, I guess, in the early days was that it either has to be very rules-based or systematic in some way. Well, you have a prospectus, right? So all ETFs have a prospectus. And I think the the 1G, like the first generation ETFs were all index replication products, but there's this whole new world of actively managed ETFs. So you still have to say, you know, these are the guidelines. This is what we're going to do in the prospectus. But an active ETF is, I think better for what we do, because especially being long convexity, long optionality, you wouldn't want to have to wait to rebalance until the end of the month or wait until an index makes a change. It's better to be able to be nimble whenever the market moves rather than, you know, so many events are, especially in the, you know, when vol markets jump, they're not things that stick around for a long time. And so I think it makes a lot more sense to do active products for what we do at Quadratic. And I didn't really know about active ETFs until a friend of mine started doing it. And then I was like, wow, these are amazing. It's a exactly like a commingled fund where you're making decisions on behalf of, you know, as a fiduciary for the investors, but it just gives lower fees, more transparency, and more liquidity. And in terms of the instruments that you focus on, it's primarily rates instruments and option-based instruments within rates is is that the sort of the scope or do you sort of venture further afield outside of rates yeah we do my firm is experienced in investing across all five asset classes so our two etfs specialize in the rate convexity markets but we do have expertise in other markets as well okay yeah and why did you start off or why is your current focus on rates and rates convexity why 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 that and not equities or credits well we were really trying to solve and better client outcomes i think whenever you know i talk to entrepreneurs like whatever industry they're in i always say like come up with a business plan a business model that will make things better for people and that's where you have a successful business and you know the the tips market those are treasuries with inflation protected security treasuries so those are treasuries that reset with CPI that market was invented in the late 90s it was right when i was starting my career at goldman sachs and i remember thinking you know this is so such a bizarre thing to have, you know, measure something as big as inflation with one index, right? You would never buy, you know, the FTSE 100 and say, aha, I have, you know, equities or buy the Dow Jones index and say, I have equities. And inflation is even bigger and harder to measure than corporates, you know, more than any, any local or global stock market. So I think adding adding another way to capture inflation and inflation expectations not measured by CPI just seemed like a very obvious thing to do. Nobody would buy one index and say, I'm done. (laughs) And inflation is so much bigger than corporates. I thought it made a lot of sense. Also, the, the CPI in the United States, it's calculated by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And a huge chunk of it is is what they call shelter But if you dig into shelter, it's actually owner-occupied rent. And specifically, a lot of it is urban rent. And so it's just not super relevant for many investors' inflation risk to have such a huge component be rent. And your approach to kind of capture 
a broader sense of inflation would be to use t- the tips markets to kind of capture the market expectation of inflation. Yeah, so our, our portfolio is mostly tips. So we have a core treasury portfolio, but then we add another measure of inflation that's not linked to the consumer price index. So the problem with tips is they, they're only CPI inflation, right? So they reset on a semi-annual basis based on the CPI, the consumer price index. It's just one index. And so we add interest rate options. They're long only fully funded long interest rate options. And the reason we do that is that inflation is a very risky asset class. You know, there's no, unlike buying, you know, stock or a bond of a corporate, you could, it can really only go to zero, even if you assume no recovery for the bond. With inflation, there, there's no zero, right? There's, you know, it can go negative. There could be deflationary outcomes. So we like using long options to capture a asymmetric payoff when it works, but also have that defined downside in case it, it doesn't work. And the options would be for both sides of the distribution. Or is it just one side of the distribution? So you're only looking for sharp moves up in yields? Or I mean, what side of the distribution are you capturing with the options? Yeah, so the options are are more similar, I think, to if you think about a, a bond with credit spread risk. A bond with credit risk takes, it has obviously rate risk, and then it has credit risk. There's There's only two types of bond risk. It's rate risk, and then there's spread risk. We don't take corporate spread risk. We take interest rate spread risk. So it's just something different. And so, you know, with Ival, for instance, we want either long dated yields to go higher, which is typically more inflation expectations where investors would demand more yield to own dollar denominated debt, or we like when the markets are pricing in lower negative or cuts from the Fed. So it also has historically had less downside than tips alone because inflation is a risk on asset. And so in periods like March 2020, tips were down, you know, 150, 175 basis points, depending on which duration you had. But our strategy actually had positive performance overall in that month because that's when the lower front dated yields kick in to kind of dampen the volatility. So Okay, so implicitly you'd have kind of a curve steepening then. Is that fair? Like it's kind of a curve steepening trade within there, embedded within there, as well as the long tips trade. Yes. And there are a lot of different rates in the US market. You know, there's there's LIBOR, there's SOFR, there's treasuries. We use the more, I'd say, global market. We don't want to use the treasury market because that's where the QE purchases are dominated. So we're using the global swap levels. So we want the widening of swaps, which can also be from credit spread risk or counterparty exposure. So it's kind of a, a neat way of capturing. It's not just a steepener, it's capturing real yields. It's capturing a level of interest rate volatility. And it's capturing also the sensitivity to the spread widening. The swap spreads widening. Yeah. And I think the, the thing that many investors really need to keep in mind that I'm always surprised that they don't know or don't remember is that many of these passive indices are very heavily weighted to mortgages. In the United States, the, the ag index, which many institutional investors considered core fixed income, the ag has about 30% of it is short fixed income volatility from the prepayment risk. You know, residential homeowners in the US can prepay their loans whenever they want. So they are long the option. If you own a financial mortgage, you're short that option to the homeowner. So I think people might say, oh, well, why do I want to be long fixed income volatility? And that's, you know, I'm like, well, you're already short it if you have passive indices. So why would you only want to be short? So I think it's been a little bit of an education to explain to people that you know, mortgages, when they are, people call them negative convexity or prepayment risk or all these, I call them uh, G-rated words for short volatility or short options. And on the swap side, one thing that we have noticed is if you look at, say, five or 10-year swap spreads, since the global financial crisis, the spreads narrowed significantly and it's kind of hovered around zero and often the swap spread goes negative. 
which is kind of odd because you'll think that why should a swap yield go negative because you're exposed, as you said earlier, you know, bank credit risk, counterparty risk, and other other types of risk. I mean, wh- why why do you think that's been the case? It's just leverage and balance sheet constraints. I mean, the swap spreads have been negative really since the financial crisis, and I think that's just a sign of investors are generally underweight duration. There's not enough high quality assets around the world, and so. It's just a sign of how much leverage is in the system because it doesn't logically make sense. Why would you get paid more yield to have, um, you know, the U.S. government as your counterparty versus, I don't know, BNP Paribas? <laughs> you know, it's like just a, nothing, nothing against BNP Paribas. I'm just the first firm that kicked out in my mind. So having negative swap spread is a bizarre situation. And I think also for for what we do inside of Ival, it's a pretty unique environment because the Treasury curve is actually a lot steeper than the swap curve. So the swap curve is about a 15 basis point cheaper, meaning a lower number. And since we want the spread widening with that strategy, it's actually a better buying opportunity. Yes. And in terms of the moves we've seen this year so far, it has puzzled a lot of people, especially to say the last six months. Obviously, the start of the year, we still had the, the reflation trades unfolding. But the last few months, you know, we've seen incredibly high inflation prints, yet yields haven't really, long-term yields haven't really done much. The curves sort of flattened, started to flatten, if anything. Have you been surprised by these sorts of moves? Well, I, I think the best way to explain that is if you had a, a crystal ball, right, on, let's just pick March 31st, you know, the end of the first quarter, the 10-year treasury was around 175 basis points. And if you had a crystal ball and said, okay, what are the next five, six CPI prints? The last, we had 6.2 is the most recent. Before that, we had five over the five handle. (laughs) I don't think most rational people with, you know, a crystal ball on April 1 would say, all right, if you know these CPI prints, where would the 10-year be higher or lower? So (laughs) I do think it's been a bit of a surprise. And at the same time, you've had the Fed really changed their tune on the hawkish commentary. So before the June FOMC meeting, the Fed was, remember this line, not even thinking about thinking about raising rates. <laughs> and so we, we did this like super, you know, I feel like it's like a checkers where you did like multiple jumps of the checker players because we went from not even thinking about thinking about raising rates to having the dot plot show two hikes. Now the world has gotten super crazy because the rates market is pricing in if you if you look at you know market expectations about 160 basis points of hikes have been priced in before the end of 23. So it's kind of an unusual time cuz you know I like to say talk is cheap. We've had lots and lots of hawkish talk since the June FMC mem- meeting which is interesting because it's also when, you know, we just found out this week that Powell is going to keep his job <laughs> and is going to stay and Brainerd's in. So I think it'll be really interesting to see if the equity market has a stumble. And I think Ival could potentially be a pretty decent equity risk off trade because you have that, you know, 160 basis points of hikes priced in. So if we did have a sell off or credit spreads widen, I think you could actually see steepening from the expectations for hikes falling. Yeah. So the front end of the curve, the yields will start to fall and then the curve would would steepen on, on that sort of basis. It kind of almost seems like what the market's saying is that the economy is so fragile that if the Fed does like three, four, five hikes, then inflation just can't take off because that's one way of rationalizing why long-term yields are so low. And even say the five-year, five-year forward inflation expectations while they picked up a bit, they haven't exploded higher in the same way as, say, front-end inflation expectations have exploded higher. I mean, do, do you have some kind of, and, and and again, another thing linked to this is why are long-term real yields so low still? I mean, all of this seems to suggest that there's a certain underlying fragility or weakness in the economy. I mean, I think the, the level of break-evens, again, is just CPI inflation, right? It's all based on CPI. And I do think it's definitely still low considering where the CPI prints have been, the the expectations for, you know, whether it's a two-year break-even and, and the the break-even curve is actually very steeply upward sloping because of a lot of investors have been worried about if there is inflation, there will likely be higher rates. And I think we always try to educate investors that 
short duration is it's almost like a fake name. You know, you're not short anything. You're just, you're really less long. <laughs> so, you know, I think many investors have been using eyeball as a way to actually profit if interest rates go higher rather than a short duration strategy still has some duration. It might have less. And so you're still, you know, guaranteed to lose money on the duration component inside that portfolio. But with eyeball, and the options asymmetry, at least in the first quarter of 2021, most people were talking about inflation at this point, but tips on their own lost money. And that's because they do have duration risk. I've always able to have positive performance and we were up a little over 3% in the first quarter, even though tips were down. And that's because when in the option, that positive convexity kind of mirror image of a mortgage really kicks in. And so I think it's it's tough because I think a lot of investors are worried about rate risk and therefore they're buying shorter dated bonds. But I also, you know, I think shorter dated bonds, especially if they're using things with credit spread risk can be quite dangerous, right? Because, you know, if you think about, you know, the recent news like Evergrande or any kind of credit event, if you have a short dated bond, the lender, the loan needs to be amended and extended, right? Or reissued, refinanced. And so you have less time to make the interest payment or the coupon payment. So a lot of times credit curves are quite similar to VIX curves or vol curves where they invert when the shorter dated bonds actually become more risky. (laughs) And so I think part of the education process has been like, look, if you're worried about interest rates going higher, Eyeball might be a really good solution for you to actually potentially profit from that scenario rather than owning short duration where you're going to be taking less interest rate risk, but you might have way more credit risk, right? Because a lot of these strategies that are short duration have you know, CMBS, ABS, MBS, CLO. Yeah. So they may be shorter in duration, but you're still long duration, just less long than a longer dated bonds. So I guess the other, the other way of playing rising yields is to just go short futures, short bond futures, just go outright short nominals. What do you think about that? Because a lot of people have been trying to just go short futures or go longer, an ETF that's implicitly just short futures. What's the issue with doing that type of strategy? Well, A, it's very negative carry, right? Because even if rates are low, you're still paying the coupon to somebody else and your timing has to be impeccable like to do that strategy. And I think the nice thing about Eyeball is the fund is long duration, right? We're not short any duration. The fund has about a seven-year duration. And I think globally, most investors are really underweight duration in their portfolio because there's not enough high quality government bonds out in the world. So I don't necessarily like the idea of just being short bonds. It's kind of like, to me, I'd rather just be, if you want that risk, that beta risk, you might as well just be long equities, right? Because it's kind of the same thing. And And then you're also paying a carry and a coupon to somebody to be short bonds. So I personally don't like shorting bonds. I like like owning duration, but having that positive convexity to do well when you either have lower front-dated yields, which is risk-off typically, that's credit spreads widening, you know, the Fed cutting rates or less hikes being priced in. So it's a nice diversifier. Because I personally, I think the whole point of bonds is to diversify equities, not add to that risk. (laughs) And instead of just adding more products with credit spread risk, which if you own, let's take a simple example, if you own, I don't know, Nokia bonds and Nokia stock, do you really have anything different? You know, you're different part of the capital structure, but you still have the same risk to management, to the product, to the sector, to earnings per share, all those risks are still there. So instead of adding credit risk, we add rate spread risk, which is not saying it's better. It's just something different. Yeah. One challenge many investors have with buying options, even as a hedge, is that options are expensive, implied trade above realized. And so you may not always earn back your premium. So what do you think about this issue? Yeah, I know a lot of people with the equity option background always find this concept very puzzling because if you own equity options, whether they're calls or puts, it doesn't matter. You pay time decay and you you know, essentially lose money every day. And there's nothing you can do to offset that except selling options someplace else or using spreads or you know, maybe buying one market versus another, or putting term structure trades on. In the rates market, it's much, it's not always the case, but a lot of the times, like today with eyeball, 
because let's think about it, you know, the spot treasury curve is around 105 basis points. The swap curve is even lower. It's about 85 basis points. But because we have 160 basis points of hikes priced in before the end of 23, the forward curve is actually very downward sloping. So the jargon terminology for that would be it's in backwardation. And so the nice thing about that is we get a lot of positive roll, even if nothing happens, because our options are rolling up from the the downward sloping forward, the forward right now, the two-year forward, for instance, is about 12 basis points, which is significantly lower than 100 plus basis points for the spot treasury curve. We don't use the treasury curve, we use the swap curve, but so it's not always the case. Okay, so you can use the, the role to fund your premium then? Yeah, so if nothing happens and you have, you know, it's just like any other commodity market or any market, the forward is what the options, because the options don't expire today, they expire in the future. It's priced off the forwards. And if spot just stays where it is, then you just get the roll. Yes. It's kind of a a pretty, I feel like a a magic unicorn because where else can you be? Long volatility, long gamma, long duration, long convexity, and ride the wave of roll. (laughs) Pretty nice place to be. It's a spread product. Just like if you think about, you know, credit, right? Let's just take US investment grade credit. Currently the spread for the, the CDX index for IG, it's around 50 basis points. So a credit investor would say, okay, I need yields lower and credit spreads tighter, meaning 50 going to 30 or 40 or you know down. For us, our optionality, our spread is about 12 basis points. And all we say is like, you know, nothing happens, we get roll, and we want that thing to widen. So it's kind of opposite credit, where credit spreads, if you own a bond with credit spread risk, you want credit spreads to tighten. We own real yields in eyeball, and then we want the spread to widen between short and long-dated rates. And in terms of just the level of real yields today. I mean, do you just think it's too low? Because I mean, you're long at very low yields. And so is that a concern or not? Well, you know, the the thing about real yields is like anything, you can look at any fixed income market and look at inflation, what actual CPI inflation has been or what other measures of inflation have been. And pretty much everything is negative real yield, right? High yield bonds are negative real yield. Investment grade credit is negative real yield. I think people pick a lot on the on the tips market because of the negative real yield. I'm like, no, that's everything's negative real yield when you have these very, very high inflation prints. And and markets can stay negative real yield for a long time. Like look at the UK market, real yields are substantially lower. And you know, I don't, I'm not trying to take a bet about where nominal or real yields are going to go. I think the nice thing with our product is you just want it to be different, right? You just want the, that's where kind of the the alpha and the strategy comes in, whether it's a risk off environment and, or the Fed tapers and that creates tighter financial conditions and they can't hike as much or whether investors see inflation not as transitory and they start to demand more yield to own dollar denominated debt. It's like either way, that's good for us. We're not taking a bet on the level of interest rates, we're taking a bet that interest rates will change in the future. As we kind of go into 2022, we obviously have, you know, the taper decision that could be a bit faster taper. Will the Fed deliver on the on the rate hikes that are being priced? What types of scenarios are you most concerned about for next year? You know, I think we're, we're heading into the midterms, right, in the United States. So I do think it'll be interesting to see. We have a lot of, you know, we just had Powell reappointed and, and, Brainerd coming in also. And so it'll be interesting to see the composition of who makes up the FOMC. And I think the one thing that keeps me up at night a little bit is worrying about what if this is stagflation, not inflation? Because I think in a stagflationary environment, I think Eyeball would likely do very well in that environment because I think we'd make money with the tips. I think rate vol would probably be shooting through the roof. Imagine if a risk parity portfolio of stocks and bonds become positively correlated, what that would do. I think it would be really good for the vol component. And I think likely if we did have a stagflationary outcome, foreign investors would demand you know, more interest rate to own our debt, especially with the fiscal spending. But I do think most investors are very, very exposed to stagflation because that would be a disastrous outcome for a 60-40 portfolio in particular. Um, That would be stocks and bonds typically selling off together. 
And instead of being negatively correlated, being positively correlated. So I think that's one scenario that I feel like is nobody was really talking about inflation when we listed eyeball. <laughs> you know, it wasn't a very popular thing. Now, a lot of people are talking about inflation, but I don't hear much about stagflation. And I think that's actually investors' bigger risk. And I think the last time, at least in the United States, when we had stagflation was in the 1970s, and that was a result of the oil embargo. Today, obviously not the same story, but as a result of the pandemic, we are having fiscal spending. We're having a massive labor shortage. We have a global chip crisis you know, around the world. It's, it's kind of like history repeating itself with a different underlying denominator problem. It's not, not the oil embargo, it's the chip crisis, it's the labor shortage, it's the supply chain disruptions. But all those things could be higher prices, but not necessarily a growth higher prices. It could just be, what if it hurts earnings per share? What if it hurts companies? What if consumers are not able to continue with the demand side of the equation too, especially, you know, I know for me, like I've been putting off a lot of things just because the delays are so ridiculous. You know, if you try to certain things that you want to buy or you want to change, you know, it's just like, I don't want to wait indefinitely for some of these items. So you're just like, oh, forget it. And, and then also like rates volatility, it's obviously picked up recently, you know, with all the, the big moves we've had in the front end. Do you think that rates vol is could go higher next year or, or not? I mean, in terms of like, where, where are I from historical perspective from on rates fall? I mean, how do you kind of see different possible paths for rates fall? Yeah. So with eyeball, we're not trying to make a bet on the level of volatility. I think the thing we're just trying to educate people on is like, if you have the ag or core fixed income, most likely you're short fixed income volatility in the US. And this is just a nice way to neutralize instead of only being short vol, here's a nice way to have, instead of always having negative convexity in the bond market, having something that has positive convexity. So to us, you know, I know a lot of all people get very focused on the implied volatility being higher than realized volatility, which is basically like 99% of the time, always the case, right? Because of course the future is more unknown than now. <laughs> it makes sense. But we're not, we're not a volatility fund, right? This is not, we're not trying to arb the difference between implied and realized volatility. We're just giving access to a market, just like the mortgage market made a single QCIP market to access that market. We are also a single QCIP market. Instead of only being short volatility and fixed income, this is a way to also be long volatility because nobody knows whether you know vol is going to go higher or lower across asset classes, it's unknown. But in your fixed income portfolio, typically most investors want that to diversify their other credit equities, other things in their portfolio that are potentially more risky than their government portfolio. So having something with a positive convexity it creates a nice, you know, potential correlation. I've always historically has not had very much correlation to equities or the ag or high yield bonds or EM because it's something different. And having that long vol component kick in is a nice thing when you want diversifying assets. And as you said earlier, because the forward curve is backwardated in any case, you know, that does pay for the premium, you could say. So in that way, whether, you know, the, the current level of vol is funded, you could say. But I do also like to ask a few personal questions as well. You know, we've obviously talked about your strategy and markets and so on. One question is, What's the best investment advice you've ever received from anyone? It was probably when I was a young trader, someone told me, do not spend your bonus until you're paid your bonus. <laughs> I think that was a good one. I do live and breathe that I like using long options to express directional views inside portfolios because we, we fully fund them. We always know our risk. It's a nice way of managing risk instead of most portfolio managers use stop losses, which is, I think, exactly, you know, it's basically borrow money to get more exposure than what you can actually buy now. And then when it goes against you, after you all have the loss, then you start to manage risk. So it's all kind of wrong way to me because you're selling your longs after they've gone down, you're covering your shorts after they've gone yeah. up. So I think it's a good way of thinking about having long convexity to have the potential to make more than you can lose versus leverage, which I'm not a big fan of using linear derivatives because it's kind of like 
it's kind of like a credit card exposure, right? Where you pay a little bit for a lot more than you can afford <laughs> or that you find. Yeah, that's very sage advice there. No, I I'm, I'm totally sort of agree with what you're saying there. And then the other question was, obviously, we're all overwhelmed with information and data and news and so on. I mean, how do you manage that information flow? Well, I love reading and, you know, constantly I'm just loving following what's going on. I do think there's so much technology now. Like if you think about like just take think about 2007 for instance before the last the global financial crisis now we all walk around with like literally personal computers <laughs> i'm holding up my iphone it's just the information access that we have now with technology is just exceptional so even with like text reading and keyword searches i think we just have access to so much information but i also think given the trend towards passive indexing and the trend to having everybody have more information faster, it likely will mean more volatile outcomes because everybody will get the information faster, move, be able to react sooner. And so it could be actually that public markets have more volatility than private markets because you have the liquidity there. And you mentioned you like reading. Have there been any books that have really influenced you a lot, either personally or in a work context? Oh, definitely. I have. I feel like I should write like a blog or something with my favorite books because I, I do have a lot of books that have been some about finance, some about history. I'm a big history buff as well. I actually have a piece that I'm doing on favorite books from the pandemic period. <laughs> so. Ah, okay. I look forward to that. Yeah. Are there any books that come to come to mind that you'd want to? I will save that question if you don't mind because I'm working on that for another project. Okay. Okay. Great. Add uh, some anticipation. Nice. It's like a trailer for a. Uh, movie. Okay. So we'll, we'll include that once we get that. We'll include it in our show notes. And now if people wanted to learn more about Ivol strategy, your, your thinking and your and quadratic capital management, what's, what's the best way for them to do that? Probably checking out the fund website would be the best way. It's, it's I like interest rate or inflation, VOL, ETF.com is the website. Eyeball ETF.com is our fund website. And the nice thing about being an ETF, it's fully transparent public fund. There's a ton of you know materials as well as articles and videos. So it's a uh, rich in information <laughs> so people can make their own decisions. And I'll include the link in the show notes so it's, uh, people can just click straight through. And so with that, it was great speaking to you. I learned a lot and I look forward to the book recommendations in great anticipation. So you know, good luck for you know what's left of the year and good luck for 2022 and hope you have kind of a restful break as well with Thanksgiving coming up. Thank you. It's really, I appreciate being your guest on the podcast podcast and I really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks for listening to the episode. Please subscribe to the podcast show on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Leave a five-star rating, a nice comment, and let other people know about the show. We'd be super grateful. And sign up to become a member of MacroHive at MacroHive.com. We'll be back soon, so tune in then.